welcome to my show. As you all can see, I'm having a tough decision in deciding which meals to choose. However, I have a lot of special guests lined up for you all today in helping me decide what I should eat healthy ones. Here's glycolysis. Hi everyone. So glucose so is your main regulatory enzyme of this pathway. Okay, that's that's really interesting. So what about the other part we? Oh, this is your energy payoff phase where basically you have two main reactions that are giving you your gain of ATP and what you want to do is using this, this gain you want to pay back the loan that you have initially invested in the investment phase mm -hmm. and you want to have a net gain. So we will see that in the seventh reaction where you have one three bis phosphoglycerate using a molecule of ATP to con and phosphoglycerate glycerate kinase is converting this molecule to 3 phosphoglycerate and a molecule of ATP is being formed as a result. What happens though, and I need to note, is two molecules of 1,3-bis-phosphoglycerate -bis yeah. that is being used to form two molecules of 3-phosphoglycerate and then that as a result you have three molecules of ATP being formed. So this three this two molecules of ATP is paying back the initial loan that you would have taken mm -hmm. in the first phase. Then you have in your tenth reaction which involves pyruvate kinase. This enzyme works on phosphoenol pyruvates using a molecule of ATP to form pyruvate, who is our very interesting and main product of this pathway and also two molecules of ATP. Just to note that initially we will have two molecules of phosphoenol pyruvate being converted to two molecules of pyruvate and two molecules of ATP. So thus, this entire pathway, what it uses is two molecules of ATP and it gains four molecules of ATP, but your actual gain is two molecules of ATP. Oh, wow. Interesting. So, yeah. should I go with my um, plate full of snacks and glucose. What I think you should probably have a, what is what is considered a balanced diet, which I think the fruits and the vegetables is a better way to go. Because when you have a high, a very high level of, I would consider uncontrollable amounts of glucose yeah. in the blood, it puts a stress and a strain on the pathway. Mm -hmm. I don't think you want that. Mm -hmm. I don't think so either. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. You have a lot of critical choices to make about that body of yours. Indeed, I do. Glycolysis, thanks a lot for coming and sharing all this very informative information. It's always a pleasure. Next in our schedule is our guest, Gluconeogenesis. Welcome, Gluconeogenesis. Hey, Sarah. How are you? I'm good. How are you? So tell me, tell me about yourself. What, what's, your, what's your functions? I'll tell you, Stella. So basically, I'm gluconeogenesis, which, you, as you should know, I'm the formation of new glucose from non-carbohydrate sources. So 90% of gluconeogenesis occurs in the liver, mm -hmm. whereas 10% occurs in the kidney. So it involves cytosolic enzymes and mitochondrial enzymes, you know? So I know you were thinking this morning about whether you know you wanted to not eat anything at all, eat those cookies, and you know, gluconeogenesis basically it occurs in the fasting state, you know, to make blood glucose during the normal overnight fast. Yeah. But you were thinking about fasting just in general because I mean I mean we've all been there, sometimes you just don't eat anything. So you actually do really need glucose, so you really shouldn't do that because you need glucose. Because it's the main primary source of energy for the brain and erythrocytes. Oh, okay. So how do my eating habits affect this? Yeah, so basically, um, your eating habits are, it plays a big part in this. I know you consider anorexia or whatnot, but even if your anorexia got to the point of starvation levels, your body may you know, produce ketone bodies in place of the glucose, but it still won't be good enough because you can't, your erythrocytes cannot use that, those ketone bodies to yeah. produce energy. You need glucose. So you, you really need glucose for glycolysis to take place. It's really, really important. And at the beginning of fasting, 
glycogen in the liver will actually break down into glucose to mm -hmm. give you that glucose you're not getting from you know fasting but it's not going to last forever so what you're going to need is for gluconeogenesis to occur so that it starts during glycogen breakdown and it increases steadily so that when your you know glycogen stores are depleted i'm still going to be there giving you the glucose that you need okay so how does this work i'll tell you Stella. so first of all you need glucogenic precursors for gluconeogenesis to occur so you need lactate from fermentation in the muscle and red blood cells you also need glycerol from degradation of fats and adipose tissues and glucogenic amino acids. But you can't use acetyl-CoA stella because you're not a planty plant. I'm not. You're not. Okay, so are you saying I'm using glycerol? Yes, you are. Wow. Basically, glycerol kinase takes the phosphate from ATP to convert, to glyc to convert glycerol to glycerol 3 phosphate. Now, the glycerol 3 phosphate dehydrogenase enzyme mm -hmm. that you have in your body converts glycerol 3 phosphate to dihydroxyacetone phosphate, also known as DHAP. That's his alias. <laughs> so, what is that occurring, Stella? You should know this. You don't know this? Mm -hmm. I'll tell you. It's oxidation, obvi. So, the DHAP is actually an intermediate in glycolysis, which, you know, will make it so that you can create glucose. Yes, that uh, glucogenic precursor lactate is converted to pyruvate and obviously you know you need pyruvate for gluconeogenesis which is me so you also use glucogenic amino acids as precursors and they also give rise to pyruvate and you know you know that you have 20 common amino acids and 18 of those common amino acids are suitable glucogenic precursors but not lysine and not leucine we don't like them yeah so they're ketogenic, just saying. So basically, you say in my body is putting glycolysis into reverse. Stella, that little brain of yours, oh Stella. No, you don't put glycolysis into reverse. That's not what's happening here. Were you listening to me? I'll tell you what happens. Basically, you can't put glycolysis just into reverse because the reaction is catalyzed by hexokinase, PFK1, and pyruvate kinase in glycolysis are so energetically favorable that reversing them would use a lot, a lot, a lot of energy, you know? And that's a, you don't want to do that, it's too much. Go, 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 it's too much for you, you can't do it, can you? You can't do it, I can't go backwards, because you're glycolysis, you can't do it, I can't do it, you're irreversible, you're irreversible, go, go, you can't, you can't do it. We're going to overexert ourselves here. So what we do instead is we have a bi we have several bypass reactions. So to convert pyruvate to phosphoenol pyruvate, your body has to use pyruvate carboxylase and PPCK to bypass pyruvate kinase. You know. So then after that, then you can do these seven reverse reactions of glycolysis that basically share the same enzymes as gluconeogenesis. So after that, that's going to get you to fructose 1,8-bisphosphate. Yeah. Then, you're not done. Then, you have to bypass another enzyme, PFK1, using fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase to make fructose 6-phosphate. Then, after that, Stella, you still got to go a little bit more. Wow. After that, you can do another reverse reaction of glycolysis to convert fructose 6-phosphate to glucose 6-phosphate. Now you have to bypass hexokinase after that to convert glucose 6-phosphate to glucose. And for that, you're going to use the enzyme glucose 6-phosphatase. Alright, Stella, you get me? Kind of. Right. So, gluconeogenesis. Mm -hmm. This was a fantastic interview. Thank you. Um, before I wrap up, guys, we have some news. Gluconeogenesis has a new video which she's going to launch pretty soon. Tell us well, all night in the show is... To make it or break it, glycogen molecule. Welcome. So, glycogen molecule, tell me about yourself. What is this make it and break it thing? Oh, well, I serve as a fuel reserve for the senses of ATP when your muscles contract. And that's where the break of glycogen molecule. Tell me, do you have a main regulatory enzyme in the make it? 
Synthes? Yes, I use glycogen synthes. And basically what that does, it adds the UDP glucose pyrophosphate as UTP. So glucose 1,6-phosphate and that forms UDP glucose and pyrophosphate. Why do I make pyrophosphate? Because pyrophosphate uses energy while UDP glucose it activates glucose. And glycogen synthes cannot function unless there are four bonds present. So tell me, who has glycogen synthase? Glycogen, of course, he's a protein and he makes tyrosine, combines its OH group to UDP glucose. But UDP don't like that, so he leaves the reaction. And glycogen synthase now actually has a chance to be activated on the non-reducing end of the chain. Okay, no problem. But glycogen is so helpful, he even catalyzes his own reaction. Oh my. So, what does glycogen look like? Oh, he's not straight. He has an alpha 161 branch. But don't tell anybody I said it. Um, oh. This is some interesting dirt we're getting here. Glycogen, tell me, what goes on in the glycogen breakdown part now? Girl, glycogen phosphorylase, he cannot remove a limb injection, and a limb injection comprises of the 4 glucose residues and your alpha 1 6 branch. Wow. Okay, how do you make glycogen straight? By two processes. First, we call the one 4 to 4 transferase. Mm -hmm. This long molecule. Oligo alpha 1 4 alpha 1 4 glucan transferase. Ah, oh, because my head just thinking about it. He removes the outer three of the four glucose residues and on the branch, he then takes it and transfers it to another branch. So you break up one four alpha branch and then you form the next one. Oh, interesting. Yes, but there's a in a single glucose residue on the alpha 1 6 branch, she has to be removed hydrolytically by amylo alpha 1 6 glucosidase, and that will give you your free glucose. Your glucosyl chain is now available for degradation, and glycogen phosphorylase can now function until four more glucose residues forms a branch again. But by the way, do you know that your hepatocytes? They release glycogen derived glucose in the blood to regulate your glucose. I had no idea. The agenda. And finally, we have the pentose phosphate pathway. Welcome, pentose phosphate pathway. Hello. Well, pentose phosphate pathway, that's a very catchy name. Well, I also have other names. I'm also known as hexose monophosphate shunt or the 6 phosphoglutinate pathway, but you can call me P, P, P. Oh, okay, P, P, P. Tell me about yourself. Well, I have two irreversible reactions, followed by a series of reversible sugar phosphate interconversions. I use these pathways to provide a major portion of the body's NADPH, which is a biochemical reductant. That just means it provides the hydrogen in cells for reduction reactions. I also make ribose 5 phosphate required for the biosynthesis of nucleotides. Wow! Where does it occur? Pentose phosphate pathway occurs primarily in the cytosol of cells, particularly in the liver, lactating mammary glands, and adipose, which are active in the biosynthesis of fatty acids. Also in the adrenal gland cortex, which is active in the NADPH-dependent synthesis of steroids and in erythrocytes, which require NADPH to keep glutathione reduced. Wow, sounds interesting. Uh, what are your reactions? Well, my overall reaction uses glucose 6-phosphate to NADP plus and water to produce ribose 5-phosphate to NADPH to hydrogens and CO2. The CO2 is just in, uh, byproduct of the reaction released from the first carbon of glucose 6-phosphate. The rate and direction of the reversible reaction of PPP is determined by the supply and demand of the intermediates of the cycle. Wow. 
How are the pathways regulated if they are regulated? Well, PPP is regulated primarily in the reaction catalyzed by glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. What is the importance of this enzyme, you ask? Well, NADPH is a potent competitive inhibitor of the enzyme and under most metabolic conditions, the ratio of NADPH to NADP plus is sufficiently high to substantially inhibit enzyme activity. However, with increased demand for NADPH, the ratio of NADPH to NADP plus decreases and flux through the cycle increases in response to the enhanced activity of glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. Well, you know, insulin enhances the gene expression of glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase and flux through the pathway increases in the well-fed state. That's why you should never make the choice of the empty plate in, in, when you're hungry because that will just limit the amount of insulin I need in my PPP. Also, eating all that unhealthy junk can lead to diabetes down the road which will interfere with insulin production and ultimately my PPP. Wow! What else in the body requires NADPH? Well, there's many synthesis of fatty acids, cholesterol, neurotransmitters, as well as nucleotide biosynthesis. Detoxification, well, there's the reduction of oxidized glutathione, as well as cytochrome P450 monooxygenases. This just in, we have increased activity in the liver of fatty acid and cholesterol synthesis. Got to go. Well, with that sudden stop, I guess we'll, we'll end the show there. Thank you so much for viewing our, our fabulous and very informative session in of the show today. Thanks, guys. In a mitochondrial matrix, pyruvate carboxylase with the cofactor of biotin adds carbon dioxide to pyruvate to create a zeloacetate. ATP activates the binding of CO2 to biotin and then CO2 is transferred to the pyruvate. Yeah, you heard the name zeloacetate is reduced in malate by malate dehydrogenase as NADH is converted to NAD+. What? You heard me. The, the male got commitment issues, so he puts on his shoes. Leaves the mitochondria if this perfect. He says, I will miss you. I'm just going to use a transport for me transport. So now malate is oxidized into oxaloacetate by cytosolic malate dehydrogenase as NAD plus is converted to NADH. After that, PPCK phosphoenol carboxycarbonase converts oxaloacetate to pyruvate, giving off CO2 and converting one molecule of GTP to GTP. Yeah. Fructose 1 6 bis phosphate hydrolyzes the phosphate ester at carbon 1 to form fructose 6 phosphate. The liver is already rich in triphosphates, so there is no need to reverse the PFK1 reaction to make ATP. In the third bypass reaction, glucose 6 phosphatase removes the phosphate from the molecule to give glucose and a phosphate. In the first bypass reaction, one ATP and one GTP are consumed per molecule. Two molecules are used, so you use two ATP and two GTP. Two, two, two GTP also. Three phosphoglycerate is converted to one three phosphoglycerate and consumes one ATP, which becomes two ATP. Consumed since two pyruvate molecules are being used. Yeah, therefore. Six trials phosphates are consumed in gluconeogenesis, making it very energetically costly. Yeah, we now know the seller's liver is using fat as an energy source. Yeah, yeah. Hormone sensitive lipase releases fatty acids and glycerol form tags in adipocytes. Acetalcoa is a positive activator for pyruvate carboxylase, so beta oxidation of fatty acids fuels gluconeogenesis. What?